It's this phallic uh, <coughs> symbol coupled together like this. And it means uh, prosperity for descendants. Can anybody tell me if uh, any of you has seen this anywhere? Hmm? What? <laughs> it's a good one. Tetris. Who would have guessed that the inventor of Tetris, maybe in the United States, knew of this? Uh, anyone else? So, um, I urge you to, if you haven't done that already, uh, you know, to check out the palaces right here in Seoul. Uh, people pay, you know, uh, thousands of dollars uh, to visit Korea to see, uh, among, you know, many things, uh, the palaces. So, please do go. And this is very, so these are all same ideas. Okay, expressed uh, differently, and this is where you find. So let's say you go to maybe even a temple. Okay, the wall. This is what you see. Okay, and as with some of some of the other ones that we uh, talked about, uh, even Koreans don't really know uh, that this that this pattern exists to begin with, and what this pattern means, okay? And uh, same, same uh, you know, visual images. Right there. Uh, same thing, but this way, this one slanted. Right here. Example number 12, uh, wild goose. Um, it represents royalty, uh, best luck. Um, goose, uh, they just have one partner for uh, their whole life, so that's why it, uh, it's sort of uh, symbolizes royalty uh, and best luck. Now, as you may have, may have guessed, uh, let's say for the midterm, I'm not going to be asking you to write about you know, the meanings of these symbols, but you, what you need to know is the, the idea, right? The, the five things, the culture, uh, the symbols, language, norms, beliefs, uh, values, and I mean, some questions could come out of the, the five things we discussed, but it's not going to be, you know, name three symbols and, you know, tell me what uh, they represent. Because you'll be learning about more important things than just these symbols. The example 13. And the 13th one is. Swastika, okay? Uh, it's a symbol of auspiciousness in Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and even uh, Sikhism, okay? And I don't know how many of you know this, but I think in present time, we think of or we associate this symbol with two things. One is Buddhism, and second is Nazism, right? But it has a, a long, long history. And you find this symbol in many, many different cultures, okay? As far back from the Neolithic era, okay? So this symbol has been in use since a, from about 10,000 before Common Era, okay? And these are some uh, examples. This one. Swastika, uh, found in Indus Valley. This one, ancient Roman mosaic uh, of uh, Spain. And this one from Israel. Okay. And this one from Ethiopia.
And these are many other sort of uh, ways you could sort of draw, and some of these are from actual uh, sort of findings. Okay. And uh, this is basically two ways you could draw swastika, uh, left to right. And in many Buddhist countries, both are used. Okay? You know that this one is the way Nazis have used, had used. Uh, but in Korea, we only use this. Uh, anybody from Japan or China? You're from? China. And do you use both or just one? Mm. Just this. Okay. Anyone from China? Yes. Do you use both or just one? Uh, I don't really know. That's fine. Can you <coughs> check this for me? Yeah. Sure. Okay. And let me know. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the students who have wrote to me. I haven't read some of them. Uh, it's really busy, right? But don't worry, I do get to read them eventually. Uh, so thanks for your input. And these are some uh, visual images. And uh, we have a, a really big temple in downtown Seoul, Jogesa. It'll take you, what, 50 minutes uh, subway ride, okay? So check it out, uh, you know, to see what Koreans do with their religion, okay? So this is inside uh, Jogetak. Okay. Um, and the last <coughs> cultural symbol that I want to share with you is the cross. Uh, if you look at the religious population in Korea, and I think I'll be showing you uh, a little bit later, the largest religion is Buddhism, okay? Uh, with about 23% of the population, okay? Who follow Buddhism. The second largest religion is Protestantism, with about 18% uh, of the population who follow uh, Protestant church. Third largest religion is Catholicism with about 11% of the population. So that's why swastika is an important cultural symbol and also the cross. So if you wanna speak of, you know, the, so you could divide symbols into traditional and so some, some, like more modern, okay? So in the case of modern cultural symbols, you could think of the flag, uh, the national flower and cross, right? Because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a religion that's been recently introduced, right? And because Korea is a small land with, uh, you know, many, many churches, we're talking about about 60,000 churches, okay? And you can't really build a church whenever you have, let's say, 50 or 100 church goers. So what uh, many churches do is to rent uh, a whole floor of a commercial plaza, uh, put up a steeple, and you have a church. Okay? Um, and I don't know if you have ever sort of been impressed by this, like at night, you look at the uh, sort of the surrounding and you see many neon crosses. You're not really seeing this well because the, well, this one's better. Um, let me share with you a, sort of a trivial anecdote. Uh, 
when my daughter was just learning English alphabet, and we were driving, and she saw all these neon crosses, she asked me, Daddy, what are all these small T's? <laughs> okay? And we talked about interpretations. Um, when my son uh, was, I think, four or five year old, uh, year old, and we're, you know, again driving around, and when he saw the bees, uh, as a, you know, male, <laughs> he asked me, Daddy, what are all those swords, right? Um, anyway, uh, since this has been shared with you, uh, maybe at night, you know, just sort of look up and see what you find. Okay, <clears throat> now, so we had a long journey uh, examining uh, the most important uh, cultural symbols, and I think I asked you this before, but having covered some of these major um, cultural symbols, can anybody still sort of have a, a symbol to share, the, the symbol that you think should be included? as the, the, the most important uh, cultural symbols of Korea. Hmm? Soju. <laughs> so, the next obvious question is, what does soju represent? Hmm? Ha hen. Han. That way, Russians have the. <laughs> Actually, um, I think the last data that, that I think I remember has shown that Koreans are the heaviest drinkers in the world. Okay? Uh, and if you have, uh, you know, father who works outside, um, comes home late at night, you know what that means, right? Um, anyway, <laughs> soju is an interesting one, but I don't know if we can include that. Um, anyone else? <clears throat> no? Move to language. Really interesting section. You may think, what can we really talk about under language? Okay, but now we'll we'll start with a light question or ice breaking question. And I want you to think. Although it's very difficult to think about this question, right? Although, just guessing game. Uh, how many languages are there in the world, you think? Someone who gets the exact number. Um, uh, I'll bring uh, Max some coffee. So, Diane, how was the coffee? It was good. It was good, huh? Have you had mixed coffee before? Uh, okay, start your guessing. 7,000. I'll give you this much hint. It's higher than that. No. Lower than that. But you came very close. And if your answer remains the closest, I'll bring a magic coffee for you. <laughs> Anyone else? It's lower than 7,000. 6,500. 6,500. Price is right. Price is, is right is not right. <laughs> I'll get two more uh, calls. Yes. 5,000. No. One more. 60. Oh, my God. Your coffee is taken, uh, taken up by uh, her. <laughs> Six thousand eight hundred. Sixty sixty eight hundred, right? Here we go. Uh, so now why do I have why did I sort of you know, am I telling you that there are these this many languages? I'll tell you a little bit later, okay? This when you know this, 
the following comments make more sense. Okay? Korean language. Before we talk about something more uh, theoretical and something more profound, let's just first start with some facts about the Korean language. Now, in terms of the number of speakers, what do you think uh, the, the, the rank of the Korean language? 13. Wow, how, you're a brilliant student, actually. Eh? <laughs> uh, how'd you guess? Uh, but what, what uh, if you didn't hear this, what, what would have been your response? Nine. Nine? Wow. I thought, like, many of you would, said, uh, would have said, you know, numbers like 30 or 40, right? But that is only about 8 million, so that's not really the, the big reason. But anyway, it's the 13th largest, because you know, we have 81 million uh, speakers. So, <coughs> South Korean population, so I think for Koreans and non-Koreans, I think having taken this course called Korean whatever, you've got to know the population, okay? It's 50 million. What about North Korea? 24.5, roughly. And approximately 7.5 million uh, Koreans living overseas. And if you add them up, you get uh, about 82 million. Okay? And uh, uh, since we're not going to talk much about uh, South Korea, North Korea division and, and the conflict, um, oftentimes, economists and even political scientists argue that to many key questions, the answer lies in population. Okay? And why do I say this? In, in South Korea, North Korea relation, or the division, or how it happened? Transport yourself back to 1945, when Korea was liberated. Okay? After 36 years of Jap Japanese occupation, um, Korea was not officially divided, right, in 1945. But it did became it did become officially divided in 1948. But from 1945 to 1948, the two sides tried to hold the national election, which if if a national election was held. Korea would have remained unified. But why didn't it happen? The answer lies in population. You see, even back in 1945, South Korean population was doubled, doubled that of South, uh, North Korea. Even today, right? It's almost doubled, right? So even back then, the population in the North was much smaller than that of South Korea. So, would, could, or should, I mean, why should North Korea hold the national election? The na election that, that they would lose, right? So that's why, just in high, just as a sort of a what if, big what if question. If there was a roughly same population, national election would have been held, could have been held, and maybe, <laughs> Uh, you know, Korea would, would, might have remained unified. And the largest number of Koreans living overseas uh, are in China, uh, followed by the USA, and then third, Japan, and fourth, Canada. Okay? And what are the top six languages, just for fun, okay? what are the top six, six languages in the world? In terms of native speakers, Mandarin, Mandarin good. Spanish. Spanish, not as high as you think. Spanish. Hindi, right? Russian, I don't know. What can we see? Mandarin, number one, for sure. Number two, big question. 
Lily Springs. <laughs> you forgot. You know, it, it comes with age. I sort of read through it this morning. But <laughs> Third is English. Um, but if you include uh, second language speakers, it's number one. Okay, uh, and I'm. But I think in, in due time, Mandarin could easily be that, you know, number one language. It's a lot of people now all over the world are learning Chinese. Okay, including a large number of Koreans. Uh, number fourth is Hindi, Arabic, Portuguese. So. Don't be too fixated on the numbers, because they, you know, I think some numbers are too high or too low. And, like Japanese language, Korean language uh, was influenced by the Chinese language uh, in the form of Sino-Korean words. And uh, native Korean words account for only about a third, okay? Uh, Sixty percent are Chinese words that we simply pronounce in Korean way, okay? uh, and we write with Hangul. Okay, uh, good example, Hakkyo. That's Chinese. We just pronounce it in, in, in the way we do. Okay, and you can come up with so many examples. Okay, Uicha. Uh, Is that Korean or Chinese? Korean. Okay, so, uh, I think one Chinese Korean word that I can remember that's purely Korean. Sara. Is that purely Korean? Yes, there you go. What is it in Chinese? I. I. Hmm? I. I. <laughs> so, emokta means eat love. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and the remaining 9% comes from loan words, uh, mostly English, right? Uh, right? Like taxi, bus, service. Hmm? service. 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 Uh, hot dog, right? uh, chocolate, computer, internet, and <coughs> Uh, now, um, don't think that I, I'm saying this because I'm Korean, uh, but this is what has been said by many people all over the world, right? Uh, Hangul, and how many foreigners in this room know Hangul enough to like send text messages with Korean Hangul? I disagree with that. Up to you. But Oh yeah, there are some words that I still have, uh, that I still struggle with, but as a whole, right? It's uh, again, I'm not saying this, but you know, linguists. Okay. So this uh, professor uh, at the University of Maryland declared Hangul as the alphabet of the world, and I think he's received. A lot of uh, scholarship or funding from the Korean government. <laughs> and per Paul Buck said that Hangul is the world's simplest and most sophisticated language in the world. You, you could agree or disagree, but uh, that's what she said. <laughs> oh, per Buck? No. She's not Korean. Does she know Korean? Oh, she must have known to say this. Probably she's referring to the writing system. Right? Yes, yes, that's what it is. And author John Mann said that it is the best alphabetic system that all other languages dream of becoming. Wow, man, that's a very powerful statement, you know? Can you imagine English just dreaming about becoming something like that? <laughs> All right, um, linguistic, to continue with these um, very <laughs> powerful comments, linguistics professor, at, uh, you know, he eats Korean food 
just an excuse to eat uh, Korean uh, food. Uh, anyway, the United Nations, so UNESCO, has designated Hangul as a World Cultural Heritage in 1997. Now, you know, back in 1997, having something designated as a World Cultural Heritage meant something. But now, every dog and whatever is designated as World Cultural Heritage. Because governments all over the world try to have something designated as a World Cultural Heritage. Why? Supposedly it brings tourists, okay? Or adds prestige to their country. Um, but anyway, uh, it's something that uh, Koreans take pride of. Uh, and UNESCO has established the King Sejong Literacy Prize in 1989 uh, to award the prize annually to an individual or organization in recognition of the effort in lowering illiteracy. And number one, very difficult question, because we have a lot of competing languages, right? English, Spanish, French, other world languages, including Chinese. UNESCO conducted research on the most appropriate writing system for more than 2,900 languages and have only oral tradition. Which language received the highest score? The answer is... Wow, you guys are really good. <laughs> That's the quick, quickest, quick, quickest response I've ever received. And the next very difficult question, what was the score? Uh, the answer is Korean, yes. The next question is even harder. Uh, in a study conducted by the Linguistics Department at uh, Oxford University, which language received the highest score in terms of rational structure, scientific accuracy, uniqueness, and practicality? The answer? Korea. Oh, my God. I'm so impressed. <laughs> and the next difficult question is, what was the score? <laughs> Um, for both questions, yes, Korean, all right? So, Korean students, are you proud? Or what did I tell you in the beginning of this course? You, sh you should have pride in your culture, but never be proud, right? Uh, there, is, there, is, there is one of the reasons why Korea enjoys one of the lowest illustrative rates in the world, and I think if you just stick with uh, Korean, the, the only reason we still have like a 0.01% illiteracy rate is because there are these particularly old women in their like 80s and 90s who couldn't get education, who were born before Korea was liberated, right? So I think maybe uh, in the near future it'll be really zero, right? Uh, on the computer keyboard, Hangul is the only language in which, I don't know if this really adds anything, but anyway, I've, I sent uh, text messages in five languages, just kidding, <laughs> uh, English and Korean, uh, I don't know if I'm biased, but for me, at least, it's so much easier to send text messages in Korean, okay? Now, just sticking with Korean and English, Am I making a, an objective observation? Or is there anyone who uses both Korean and Chinese, uh, English, but you find sending text messages in, in English is, is, easy, is easier? Anyone? I think Go ahead. I think it's a question of habitude because I could study Korean on my, on my smartphone, but since I was raised in a European country, it's so much easier for me to type in English because I know where the letters are on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't see any real logic in the way the consonants are displayed on the current keyboard uh, with trouble. So I think it's a question of attitude. Same. I write in English and Spanish way faster right? because I've been all my life writing with the output. Right? But my time I'm writing, I'm writing at 12, but it's still slower than here. So I think I should ask someone like me. Who is who could you know who is just totally uh, proficient in terms of like writing uh, in in either Korean or uh, English? And for someone like me, 
I definitely find uh, Korean writing much easier. And, but again, that's personal experience, and I should not sort of make it as like a, like a fact. Okay? But anyway, uh, there's that argument. And let's skip that. Okay, that next, uh, this is where I want, I get a little bit more serious. Um, are you guys familiar with the uh, Sapir Wolf <coughs> hypothesis? The, the, they simply argue that the way people think, okay, their worldview, is strongly affected by the language they speak. Okay? So language not only expresses our thoughts and perceptions, but also influences our perception of reality. Okay? And so what this means is that people who speak different languages see the world differently. Now, does that make sense? Yes. See, some of you may go, so if I speak English and if I speak Korean, or do people who speak English, can they really see the world differently than people who speak Korean? I mean, some people may question that. But now, see, that is why I want you to go back to that question of how many languages in the world there are in the world. 6,800 languages. And so when you make comparisons between, let's say, advanced languages, like English, with, let's say, 6,700 languages that are relatively less advanced than the answer you find the answer. And here are some examples. Uh, the Aztecs had only one word for snow, frost, ice, and cold. Okay? One word. So can you experience Anything that, that there is no word for? I mean, of course, you can see something and then you go, oh, it's something that I cannot, I've never seen. But you see, vocabularies have a huge impact on the way we think. Okay? But let's say if you're born into an Aztec culture, you can just see this. You don't know, you don't know the differences. You just group them together and there's just one word for it. Okay? So that, so, so the idea that you know, people who speak different languages see the world differently is based on these comparisons. Not necessarily comparing you know, Chinese, Korean, English, Spanish. Okay? It's more about sort of advanced languages versus sort of less advanced languages. Okay? And Inuits, in Inuit language, they, there's no real word for snow, okay? But 20 words associated with snow, okay? Like uh, different types of snow falls, like heavy snow, light snow. See, we add adjectives, right? But in other words, there is just, you know, a separate word for, for these different conditions of snow. Snow on the ground, snow falling, snow drifting, and so on, okay? And in Koya uh, of South India, they do not distinguish among snow, fog, and dew, but their language distinguishes the seven types of bamboo. Okay? And what about uh, for the Filipinos? There are several terms for bananas. And for Koreans, Chinese, and Japan, how many different words? Three. And can you name those three terms? See, in English, there's only one word, rice. Why? They don't respect rice. <laughs> because they're bread eaters. Yeah, bread. There's so many different types of bread, right? But for a long time, we just had one type. You know, toast bread. Yeah? But now we have baguettes uh, and all different types. But anyway, how many of the three names we have? Hmm? Sari. And sari is harvested rice, but uncooked. Pap. Pap is cooked rice. Pyong. Rice in the field. You see? 
Why do you have these two, three different terms? Because we love rice. Chinese, Japanese, Koreans. We used to eat rice for every meal if we had enough food. Okay? Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I love rice, uh, although I, you know. Anyway, I love rice so much I call myself racist. <laughs> Are you racist? <laughs> Uh, so when you use this term racist, you gotta mention my name because I invented the term racist. Someone who thinks rice is the best, okay? Uh, oh, I shouldn't be that arrogant. Uh, just to say I love rice. Um, uh, and you know, believe it or not, human eye can make between 7 and 10 million colors. Okay? Uh, but some languages or many languages only have two colors. Isn't that amazing? Just two colors. Warm colors and cold colors. It's unimaginable, right? But people living in these cultures, that's what they see. And that's only, that's, they can only express colors in two ways. See, going back to what Sapir and Wolf said, speaking different languages, you see the world differently, right? Does that make more sense now? Okay. And there are some, uh, also, uh, sort of, you know, we have many ideas about time, but it's a modern invention, okay? It came about with industrialization, because to work, you needed a sense of time. And did you ever ask yourself, why the hell do we have a nine o'clock uh, you know, school time? Society is work preparing you to be a working VP. I mean, I'm just putting a little twist on that, but that is true, okay? Educational system is so tied to the economy, you know, again, the reason why nine o'clock school work, I mean school sort of time, is the same as the work time is because, again, you can't really find a document that sort of says, you know, this is what happened, but uh, if you believe that sort of nothing in life really is accidental, uh, I mean, because everything is done by design, right? So that's why um, this sort of idea of time is really closely tied to industrialization, and uh, capitalism, okay? And here's a one good example of uh, how uh, speaking different languages, you sort of, sort of see the world differently. A study was conducted in which bilingual Japanese-American homemakers were interviewed, first in Japanese and later in English. The same questions, okay? But look at the questions here. When my wishes conflict with my families in Japanese, she says it is a time of great unhappiness. But in English, I do what I want. <laughs> Same respondent. Okay. I will probably become, in Japanese, a housewife. In English, a teacher. Real friends should help each other in Japanese. In English, be very frank. Okay. So, uh, these kinds of studies were shown, uh, you know, on, you know, the subjects in Hong Kong too, right? So, um, anyway, keep that in mind. And uh, in the case of, uh, let's say, Americans, they are more like more likely to use expressions like strongly agree or strongly disagree. Okay? But they, the Chinese and Japanese, they tend to choose less extreme responses. And you know how, you know, sometimes I know finally what uh, I probably mean in Korean. Okay? For example, let's say I ask a group of teaching assistants, I want to buy you lunch this Friday. Okay? And their response in English, in, 
in Korean. 괜찮을 것 같아요. Okay? In translation, it means I think it's gonna be okay. Now, in English, is it a yes or no? Yeah. I think it's gonna be okay. Don't you need confirmation? That's right. So you take that as a yes and you definitely show up for lunch. No, no, no. Okay means okay, right? But if the answer is, I think it's okay. The I think it made a difference. Anyway, what happened was, on that Friday lunch time, I, mean, I was home. Because I didn't get a positive, res positive response when they said, I think it's, good. it's okay. I waited for further confirmation. Okay? Because if you ask a Korean, it's, never, it's often never yes or no. It's always, mm, I don't think so. Or, I think it'll be okay. But, so, so even in English, that's, a, that's sort of a firm, yes or no, firm, firm yes. So if someone asks you, well, if you want lunch, I'll be like, oh, I think that's okay. It's usually for me, at least. Okay. It's implied that it's okay. If it's going to be happening, like, right away, it's definitely okay. But I'm talking right about, away. let's say, I'm asking the students on Monday about Friday. And the, the answer is, I think it's going to be okay. Now, do you need to confirm or not? Here you go, you see. I waited for confirmation, but students, their, what their message was, yes. That's the point I'm making, you see. In Korean, 그럴 것 같애, 같애. It's going to be, it looks like, means yes. It doesn't look like means no. Or I'll probably can go means I'll go home. Okay? Yes or no? Am I making the right, right uh, interpretation? So it goes with this, you see. Koreans do not really make their sort of, uh, sort of firm expressions. It's always like reserved. Okay? Uh, same thing with this. When you give something and you go, oh, no, 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 it's okay. So we have this. No, no, yes principle, right? <laughs> so you like to get it, but you say, oh, no, it's okay, twice. And then get it, okay? Or let's say you visit your friend's house, and you're so totally starved, and your, your friend's mother goes, oh, are you hungry? I'm, I'm, I'll prepare you lunch. No, 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 it's okay. No. Even though you're starving, okay? yeah? So that's sort of a, a cultural rules of speaking the language. Okay, so another thing about language is that language sort of contains the core values or reflects the core values of the speakers in society. Okay? And can you think of any examples? I think this is a good question for uh, Koreans. So speaking, the, speaking the language, what kinds of values do you see? Yes. Okay, we have many different levels of honorifics. Yes, yes. Okay, very good. Very good. So, collectivistic mindset is reflected in the way we use we, right? Then, rather than I, uh, in all of our conversations. Yes. Okay, title color, yeah, yeah. okay? Instead of uh, names, titles, yes? There's a second set of vocabulary for um, elders. You don't use the same words. Yes, okay, that's honorifics. We have six levels of honorifics, believe it or not. Six, but in common language you use, it's three levels, okay? Uh, for example, have you had lunch? Blunt form is 점심 
처롱 <웃음> 점심 먹었냐 right? Second level would be 점심 드셨냐 Third would be 진지 드셨어요 Something like that, right? Or can you say 진지 처 No <웃음> Um, anyway, anyone else? Yeah? No word for you. No. 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 Dangshen. Yeah, we have a uh, word for no. But no, you can only use to, to someone inferior. Uh, like in age and status, but I think a lot of people don't like to be sort of called no, right? Maybe other than lovers, uh, maybe that shows manliness. No, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yes. So someone did mention. So it shows our collectivistic mindset. Yes. Maybe Korean is relationship based society, so we like to omit you and I. We no. don't. We like to use. We like to omit you and I. You and I. Yeah. Like for example, we don't say in English. We say I love you, but in Korean you just say 사랑해. So. So we don't use sub subjects. Yeah. And why is that? Because we are relationship-based society. Oh, I have to look into that. Are you guys following? Um, in English, if you want to say I love you, you say, you, say, you say I love you. I love you. But in Korean, you just say love as a verb. <laughs> right? Love her. <laughs> to love. To love. And you, you may go, hey, who, who do you love? <laughs> yeah. um, but that is a reflection of how we emphasize relationship. I have to look into this. But thanks for bringing up something that is making me think. Yes. I think it's great. So, could we say that it's reflective of our collectivistic mindset? Because if you say you and I, it's always distinguishing. Or maybe it's putting some distance between you and I. Or you and I are separate uh, existences. Or beings, or entities, or... That's a really good one, you see. We don't say I, right? Now, it's not just that we don't we use pronoun my. So it's, it's also true that we don't say I. Because you know, Joyo, Boleo, without I, right? So if you say I, doesn't that make it too selfish? Because you're putting too much emphasis on what your wishes are, what you know you want. Okay? But if you say without I, it sounds more neutral. Amazingly good stuff. Yes? I don't know, it's because of confusion now. In English, like, uh, don't you agree? Then I say no when I don't agree. Uh, say it again, please. <laughs> uh, we respond in the uh, reflex of their question. So in, the, in English, it says, uh, don't you agree? And if I say no, then I don't agree.
example, if I uh, listen uh, to what you said correctly, you know how in English, if you want to respond, if the answer is, don't you like it? If you don't like it, you say no. Because if you like it, yes. But in English, in Korean, it's the opposite. And the ex you, your explanation for that is? I mean, so say it one more time. Okay, everyone, listen to what he's saying and carefully. If I got a yes or no question, yeah. then I answer in the response for uh, opponent's question. So if they ask, don't you agree? And I say yes, then I agree. Yes, I agree. Yes. But in Korea, if we say yes or don't you agree, then that means, yes, I, I agree with the thinking that <laughs> and if that is true, I mean it is true, why do you think <coughs> we have this in, in, in Korea? It could be a part of the collective mind yeah? that we uh, respect what he thinks or her. You guys are making me think too much. <laughs> <laughs> Students who speak languages other than English, uh, do you follow the English example? So, so no is no, no matter how the question is phrased. So it's only Korean. What about Chinese? Japanese? Wow, Chinese same thing? Chinese is the same with Korean. Ooh, no, there's a major cultural difference here then. So I think your explanation there's got to be some val validity to it. Yes? I think that um, in English, we're, it's a very expressive language. So when English speakers are answering a question that's phrased in the negative, you are expressing how you feel about the sentiment of the statement. When you're saying, don't you agree, you're trying to see whether or not they agree with you. So you, you answer the sentiment, whereas in Korean, you answer the question because the conversation is more important than the expression of how you feel. So if that's the case, it has nothing to do with uh, collectivistic versus individualistic well, orientation. Individualism means that we like to express our feelings. Like, I want to express my own feelings yes. rather than see if everyone is in agreement with mm. Interesting example, take. Yes. For example, if you ask, haven't you eaten? Eaten? It's, I mean, same. It doesn't matter. Don't you agree or haven't you eaten? <coughs> the answer is if you didn't eat, you say no. Haven't you eaten? I'll say yes, I haven't eaten. That's right. If you say yes, in Korean it means you didn't uh -huh. eat. Uh -huh. But I mean, uh, it doesn't show. Uh, don't you agree? If you ask, don't you agree? I, I agree and I want to know that my open, my open interest and but if I ask, how much you eat it, I just want to know if you eat it. Mm. Anyway, uh, we'll like to move on. But I want you to think about this. And can you guys, you know, when, I'm, when I have to point out, that means I sort of was patient. Maybe for the three, four times. So don't do this. Because... You see how this is so interrupted? Because I've been, I have to say this, that am I blushing now? I lost this smiling face, didn't I? And I don't want to do that. Because you are, uh, being, you're not being courteous to the whole class. But never mind me, class, okay? Um, this is what I want you to do. Uh, in your free time, Think about this question, why, let's say the, generally speaking, the West and East, and <coughs> here East means, just for the sake of convenience, Korea, China, 
Japan. Why do these speakers have a different way of sort of expressing when it comes to these questions which, which require yes or no? Okay? Uh, and here we go with the examples. First, honorifics has already been mentioned. And of course, this is a, uh, you sort of use honorifics to show respect. And uh, I told you that there are six levels. Example number two. Um, we, in our languages, sort of hierarchical worldview is built in. Why is that so? I mean, the use of honorifics itself shows you how in Korea everything is hierarchical. Okay? So that uh, if you just, I mean, the rules of speech are so much shaped by this principle of hierarchy, and some words definitely show this, right? Within the family, you have a rank, and how many languages? Do you know which distinguish family members by rank? I mean, there are some other languages that do that, but I don't think it's a, a common thing, right? Uh, and uh, depending on the rank, there's a strict rules of conduct. I mean, it's sort of less so now, but when I was growing up, uh, I had to strictly obey my uh, older brothers. And I have Han. Because I'm the youngest child in the family, so I had to be, you know, I was pushed around quite a bit by my older brothers and sister. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we don't call each other by the first name. Yeah? So, just among the same aged friends, a name is called, and maybe parents and older uh relatives who call you by your first name. Other than that, you see, even among friends, believe it or not, you know what they call me? Professor Kim. And some parents, and I think not some, but many parents who are so proud of their sons and daughters who are like professors, they call them, you know, Professor Kim. Okay? So, uh, this kind of title calling has become uh, so embedded in our culture that uh, I think in many, some Hollywood movies, it's sort of made fun of, right? When Asians meet, let's say, you know, foreign or foreigners for the first time, before even they shake their hand, the first thing they do is to take out their business, business card, right? So, because they do that in order to sort of establish Okay? Hierarchy. Where they stand. Okay? Um, and, uh, and also, uh, I mean, just in passing, um, sort of rules of speech in Korea, right? That junior never interrupt or contradict a senior. It's a powerful statement. Language is a means of harmony, not a means of discussion. So, uh, that is why I think, you know, uh, when I ask a question in a graduate seminar, never mind a lecture, graduate seminar is where you just talk, right? You just, you know, discuss. But Korean students are known to be very quiet, yeah? uh, because they have not been really trained to question or challenge the instructor uh, and to make their uh, thoughts be sort of known. I should uh, just as in passing, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, you know, between 1970 and 1999, Korean Air uh, had a series of accidents. And, you know, some people asked is it because Korean Airline has old planes? Anyway, ultimately, what they found was that the when accidents happen, because of the captain's bad decision, okay, then the, so the, the cause of accidents was not mechanical. 
It was uh, a poor decisions made by captains. Then the next question was, so what's happening in the, in the cockpit? And what they found was, captains had too much power. And the co-pilots just could not question their decisions. Okay? And for Koreans, that makes sense, right? Can you challenge your sunbed? No way, right? Uh, so that is why, I don't know if this is true, but at the time, they made it a rule for all the pilots to speak in English. Okay? Uh, because Korean language makes one hierarchical. Okay? And as, you, as everyone in this room who speaks English knows, English is very horizontal. Okay? But Korean, very strictly hierarchical. Okay? So uh, that's why um, the use of Korean was banned. Uh, I don't know if this is true still. And uh, for some time, all the new, pilot, new captains happened to be Westerners or non-Koreans. Okay? Because that way, co-pilots could challenge the decisions made by captains. Example number three. I should have taken a one minute break. I only got two, 10 minutes, 10 more minutes to go. Example number three, Koreans' co collectivistic mindset. And this was already mentioned. We say uri, our instead of my, uh, uri nara. Um, I haven't heard anyone in Korea who says nae nara, right? It's always uri nara. But someone told me that uh, in North Korea, they sometimes use or are encouraged to use the term my country. So if anyone is interested in this, look it up. Okay? If that is the case, why? Okay? Ne nara. Ne kukka. Right? So, uri uh, jip, uri appa. You know, I could hear you guys. I can't believe this. Class is over.